when it's hard right from the start. You get a new client, either online, from the waiting room, they're nonverbals, maybe they're very assertive, aggressive to each other. How do we get started well when starting well is hard? Welcome to the Leading Edge in Emotionally Focused Therapy with your hosts, Dr. James Hawkins and Dr. Ryan Reyna. EFT is a dynamic model that humbles even the most seasoned therapists. Together, we want to come alongside you as you continually push the leading edge of your understanding and application of this wonderful model developed by Dr. Sue Johnson. All right, welcome back. We're continuing our series, all request series from uh, listeners who've uh, sent in messages wanting us to talk about a certain topic. And so we have a special guest today. Uh, James, would you mind introducing this person? Yeah, De'Aaron Washington is a member of the Louisiana EFT community. Uh, definitely a great person. I've gotten to work with him before in some other trainings. Really appreciate Louisiana EFT. They have an externship coming up here with George Fowler. So definitely check out the Louisiana EFT community. But let's go ahead and hear De'Aaron's question straight from him. What does first session look like? Um, how do I handle it when there is like is escalation or even to the point like, man, how do I handle it? How do we handle it when it just they just don't seem very hopeful in the beginning uh, because of all they've been through and what has happened to them? How do you get focused? How do you start off on a on the right foot? How do you start off on the right foot when there's so much happening in the room and a lot of tasks to get done in the first session? That was really what I was thinking about. Uh, hopefully that made sense. Um, if it didn't, man, feel free to ask a follow-up question. All right. So that is what we're going to talk about is what do you do in first session? That's a good question. Particularly, one, just from a general standpoint, but then what do you do in first session when they're coming in hot? Yeah? So I want to go with – let's go with general first session, for, uh, if you don't mind, Ryan. And I want yeah. you – if you don't mind kind of kicking it, well, I guess I'll go there. I mean, for me, first session, of course, y'all already know the regular therapist stuff. I'm not going to belabor you on that one. But then for me, and every EFT therapist can have a different framework, I like to give them a lot of space in the first session just to kind of figure out what it is they came in there for. And I'm taking this one from Sue. I want to see what it's like to have to for them to talk to each other or to talk about their relationship. So I'm not going to guide as much. I'm going to give them some more free space to kind of tell me their story and watch how they tell the story and how they interact. Um, and each EFT therapist might handle this different, too is I, for me personally, I don't teach EFT explicitly. I just give them a general description of what my role is in the therapeutic process and kind of what how I see that process play. I talk about the stages, but I don't say stage. I say, hey, at the beginning, I think, you know, you two, you've probably been doing a lot of hard work and things feel chaotic. I got to sort through some of that chaos and just kind of get clear, like, where is it hard for you two? Where are you stuck? Where does it get blocked at for you two that you can't kind of succeed in the things that you're trying to do. And I want to find those spots and I give them explicit explanations about clarity, safety in the room. And then, you know, and once we get that kind of resolved and settled, we're going to go drop down into some deeper work of what has been fueling those cycles that get in the way of you two being able to talk together. And then what we use to close out with is as you two make gains, I want to see what it's like for you to do it for you. When those cycles come up, can you kind of course correct? So that's my little quick, like even just that fast, description of the EFT process. Um, and I let them know, like, ev at times in here, I'm not going to let you interrupt each other or over talk each other or do things that hurt each other. I've got to guide the process and help you do it in a way in this office that you can't do it at home. And so sometimes I, I might jump in and I'm going to have to refocus you when we get off that track. And that's my job is help create focus and help you to practice what you struggle to do at home at times here in the office. That's my quick speech. I don't know if you have anything else on session one. Uh, not a lot. That's pretty similar to me. You know, you got to hit informed consent. Yep. Um, and and then kind of go from there. But I, I'm much less active the first session and a half or so because I'm going to be real active at times mm -hmm. later on. So I want people to to feel listened to, to feel heard, mm -hmm. listening for what motivates them, you know, listening for contraindications, which would just make me want to slow down a little bit. Um, I, you know, I end every first session with the whole piece like we've talked about before of, you know, is this a relationship that both of you go to for comfort, you know, and trying to spin off a little bit of psych ed, that that's kind of the target that I'll be shooting for. Um, but I think this is a good question, De'Aaron. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so thanks to Aaron for, for being with us and, and uh, asking a good question because I think, you know, you, it's two different things is what I hear there. One, mm-hmm. when they come in hot or two, when they come in not hopeful, which I guess could be the same. I'm interpreting like them a little bit different, yeah. you know, because sometimes people won't stop talking when it's hot and then other times they, they don't have anything to say. They're kind of crossing their arms and, or, you know, it's a communication, but, but not one that's clear. So I think, and, and to me, they bring forth very different responses from me. And again, this is me indicating my interpretation of what De'Aaron said. So I could be wrong, but you know, when they come in hot, I've got to take an active stance and they've got me out of order. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing I'm thinking about. Okay. Because I wanted to go over informed consent and making sure I got emergency contacts and, you know, mandated reporter stuff. And I got to go over some form of no secrets policy. And, you know, when they're screaming and yelling, you can't really do that. Mm -hmm. And I've had that happen before, you know, 15, 20 times, not 500. Most people are pretty nice for three or four sessions before before we get a little more real. But I've had it happen before. And and it's a hard place because I kind of want to set the informed consent aside to like, you know, dance a little bit and match the intensity here and try to establish safety. And yet you're also sort of, that's a little bit of an ethical dilemma. So I'm doing therapy with someone that I don't have signatures from yet and we don't have the, our process established. So, you know, what I'd prefer to say is guys, I hear it, this is so hard. It sounds like you're saying this and you're saying this and this is a really tough spot. I need you to do me a favor. Can we call time out? I need seven minutes, I need eight minutes here. I've got to go through this paperwork. You know, that sort of thing. I do think it's an opportunity to become the stronger, wiser other, which they clearly need mm-hmm. uh, in that moment. And then the other piece to me is, is very different. If they're not hopeful and they're, there's sort of a sadness there, I want to do informed consent. And then I want to spend some time grieving with them because this is not what they signed up for. And this is a pretty bad place to be. Mm-hmm. You know, and if they're not hopeful and they're in my office, I mean, that's, that's really speaking to, I think, an even greater form of pain than someone who comes in hot, right? So I think being mindful of matching, you know, what comes to mind for me. It's what top of my head. Yeah, no, that sounds good. I like how you broke that down into coming in hot. So I think you set some good ones around that. Um, one for me is we're going to set parameters of safe. So it depends on how they're coming in hot. You know, one of the things I think, you know, I didn't play all of De'Aaron's message, but if they come in hot with like a lot of blame or they're name calling each other, then we've got to we've got to go ahead and set a model on that right from the beginning in first session. Um, I I talked to Chad M. Hoff, who's another great EFT supervisor. And I I said, Chad, what do you do on the first session when they kind of come in, you know, in just really hostile places? And he says one of the phrases he'll say the first time they if they call each other names or something, he'll be like, hey. That's not going to work here. You know, we got to make sure that we don't do that. Then the second time he gets very explicit. I can't let you do that in front of me. If I let you to do that in front of me here in the office, nobody will feel safe. And this process will not work to be able to do this process about, you know, I'm stealing from Catherine Ream here now at in the Chad's words. It's I got to cre- create safety so you two can f- to be able to take risk with each other. So I can't let you do that. You've got to be that explicit in yeah, session one. That's good. Thanks, Chad. Because going back to what Ryan said, if you can do that, you're showing them there's a stronger, wiser other in the room Mm -hmm. who's not going to let the, and I'm talking about the process, who's not going to let the process be a bully and beat them up. Right. And then stealing from Ryan's words. Because if you do, they're going to both leave feeling worse. Yeah. Even the person who called names and their reactivity, they're just trying to kind of say something hurts here. Something's painful here. But even after they do it, that's not who they want to be more times than not. So. Yeah, and, and by stronger, I'm quoting John Bowlby there, mm-hmm. you know, with being a, a major part of attachment is having a stronger, wiser, other, a secure base that you go to. So I'm trying to be the secure base. I'm not trying to be stronger than the client. That's right. I'm trying to be stronger in the cycle. That's right. And that's the competition that we're really in here. It's 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 the therapist and, and our combination of self and training versus the intricacies of that negative reactive cycle, which is if you're looking for something that'll keep you humble, I just do a lot of couples therapy. And with that, let's take a quick break. If you like the content of this podcast and you want more specificity and ability to see it, a team of EFT trainers, supervisors, and therapists work together at successandvulnerability.com to create a focused online training program 
to help you learn how to work in some of the hardest places in emotional and relational distress. Check us out at successandvulnerability.com. All right. Yeah. So I want to say this, and this is something that has evolved over the course of my career, and I'll make space for it re-evolving or going some direction. But as of today, I, I try to be a little bit more explicit, especially early on when couples are in a bad place about shaping their expectations of what can and cannot work. And Sue Johnson may get mad at me for saying this or, or you know, some other fancy trainer who's way better than me may say, hey, you shouldn't do that. But, you know, I don't go into a whole thing about EFT. I don't try to hide it. But I don't, I don't want my, my clients to be worrying about a therapy model, right? Just like you, I want to describe the process and my role. But, you know, I do want to talk about, you know, when people were in such a bad place coming in hot context here, meaning, um, you know, here, here's, here's five or six really good reasons for you to do this. Mm. It, it, I, I see what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Yet I also need to be clear. There is no chance your relationship will improve unless we are able to alter how this protection process plays out. Like mm -hmm. I, I try to get really, really specific there because I think some people think that uh, relationships will get better just from osmosis. Like they're going to come in and something will just drift off to them, you know, or, or they can just come in and share their side of the story and maybe their partner will change. And, and that's fantasy land. That's not how this goes. And so you know, either protection will come in or people will take risk with their heart, but both will not happen. And so I, I try to make that pretty clear with them by the end of the first session if, if things are difficult. I love that, Ryan. I hope y'all caught what he just said. That was, I should have pressed a nugget alert button on that one, Ryan. But that was huge. Come in with validation first, especially in the first mm -hmm. session. Remember, you have not earned that alliance yet. Um, so you really need to start off with some validation. I get the good reasons why you have to do this right now. And, you know, of course, it gets it gets a little bit iffy if there's like name calling and that kind of thing. We're not going to validate. I get why you call your partner this or whatever. You're not going to do that. But I get the reason why you're trying to get my attention. I get the function of the energy right now and what you're trying to do. But I like how Ryan, this is the part I want to make sure a therapist know. You have the right to be explicit and direct. You need to be able to tell them. I get what your energy is trying to do. And then, because in our client's mind, it makes complete sense that they would do it. How could I not do this? And you need to take that protest for them. But I got to let you know if you keep doing it this way, it is not going to work, and nor will this process work. Right. I just got to, because remember, we are kind of like the paid professional. You know, a doc, you don't go into your orthopedic. We're not kind of like it. We, yeah, are. we are. That's we're right. <laughs> you, you don't go into your orthopedic surgeon and then they tell you like, hey, you should put this cast on and keep it on for three right. months. And uh, all of a sudden you think, no, I want to take it off in one. Your orthopedic surgeon, well, I guess you do whatever you want. They're going to tell you like you can do that, but you're going to hurt your bone and have a further injury. You're going to cause more complications and it's going to be way worse than it when you first came right. in here. That's your choice, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to assist you in it. And that's what they will say. I'm not cutting. You know, they might not want to cut the cast off in some ways. But yeah. And if we're going with that metaphor just for just a minute, and this happens with medical professionals, you know, a physical therapist has a patient who won't do their exercises. And the physical therapist isn't being kind to not point that out. <laughs> they don't have to be mean, but they've just got to say, hey, look, I hear you. This hurts. And yet we, it's going to always hurt. That's right. If I can't get you to do a little, okay. you know, or the or the MD who says, you know, say won't come for surgery and, and that's a problem. So, yeah. You want to switch to the other yep. side? I want to switch to hopelessness. Now, we've done an episode on this, and if your clients come in hopeless in the first session, it's, I wouldn't say it's too much different than what we told you in the podcast. You need to validate the hopelessness and that they feel that way. Like, hey, same thing, five good reasons why this is hard. So if I'm understanding you too, I mean, you're even here in my office, which means you've made a commitment, you went through the paperwork, you're paying but everything you've tried, it really hasn't worked. You've tried, you've literally emptied out all of your resources in a way of all of your best efforts to try. And now you kind of arrive here in this place and you're not even really sure if this is going to work. That's hard. That's difficult. And what I'm saying is, is and I appreciate De'Aaron's question, my job in the first session is not to make their hopelessness go away. And I know that's hard for ourselves or the therapist because it's like, oh my gosh, if it's hopeless right. already, it feels like... You know, is my, in a sense, my client, the relationship going to die before I ever yeah. get a chance to try and resuscitate it? 
But uh, I don't try and rescue that away. I kind of sit in it with them. They need me to join in with it and to show them that I see it and that I recognize what we're working with and maybe the dis- the desperateness of the situation. So I would tell people, you need to be clear and explicit with the hopelessness that's in the room and then find the good reasons why they feel hopeless. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that one point. And, and there's some EFTers out there who do this differently. I want to affect hope, mm-hmm. not try to talk them into it. Mm-hmm. And um, because people, hope is a lot like confidence. You get confident after you get successful. That's right. And and hope is the same way. Um, so I want to grieve with them. Um, my presumption, my assu- my attachment presumption is that the cycle has beaten them down. Mm-hmm. And that makes perfect sense to me. It's demoralizing. Mm-hmm. The, the two or three things I do to make this better always make it worse. Mm-hmm. And that sucks. And that's awful. That's what I'm going to tell them. And, and sit with that as long as we need to. What, what both of these have in common is they're certainly, they're certainly on the path one, you mm-hmm. know. So but that's path one work here. Mm-hmm. These are not people who are in a place where they're open and curious, vulnerable, ready to take risks, mm-hmm. right? So if you follow the way we've taught that, you know, path one says when there's all that pain there and reactivity and chaos, we need to bring forth yourself and get ready to grind. And I think that's a word we should probably use more often because those are not fun sessions, but they're important sessions where you grind and grind and grind, just like the previous episode, running your assembly, bringing forth your talent, your ability to frame and reframe things as an attachment pieces, trying to find those vivid triggers and that toxic attachment message that comes off that trigger. And I want to do an episode on this later on, but I don't mind saying right now, if you get a really vivid somatic trigger of what they notice on the partner's body language and you're able to track over what toxic attachment message that comes in, that has a big time de-escalating effect. Mm. Okay, because what you're saying is you're not crazy. When this happens, if that if that message is sent, of course you get hopeless or of course you about jump off the couch because that is horrible to, to even consider that, that your partner sees you that way that's awful, right? And that de-escalates them because if you even hear my tone, I'm trying to increase this. They don't have to. Uh, so get get going on the assembly. Yeah. And the worse people are, I should say, the less healthy the relationship is, they're going to need even more repetition of that assembly. So therapists, we get impatient with that. We don't like it. We want to do more. Mm-hmm. And I want to do more too, but they've got to be ready. Mm-hmm. So I want to make sure I go back for a moment and – we don't have to close out yet, but I want to make sure I get it. So I liked what you said, Ryan. If they come in hot in session one, we know there are certain tasks that we have to be able to accomplish, period. And even some of it's in very legal and ethical. So even if they are reactive or down in hopelessness, we can't just push the informed consent to the side. If we need to, we can make a comment on what we see. We've got a idea if it's like really hot reactivity, give some validation, say, hold on, though. Let me give, I need seven minutes just to get this part done so that way we can't open that somewhere. I can't really, technically you can use that ethically, I can't really open that until I have your for, informed consent to do it. It's almost, I mean, I hate, I, you know, I've been in ER settings before and the ER doctor, they do kind of have a way where they can do what they need to do if the client's incapacitated. Mm-hmm. But if you are, if you are somewhat, you know, lucid and you can kind of, they're going to be like, I need you to sign off on this. I need you to give me verbal consent mm-hmm. just to cover themselves. Mm-hmm. So. We need to do the same. Then once we've done that, I think the model we've set for both of them is move towards them with validation. You haven't gotten that alliance to kind of, but move towards the hopelessness and the um, reactivity with some form of validation, highlight it. But then this is where we got to be explicit and clear. This isn't going to work. And so you got to be that clear with them. And even in session one, then I would come behind it too with and remind them of what your role is. So I'm sorry. And I would even offer some kind of like repair work because that is a rupture early before you get alliance. So I'm sorry if that lands kind of hard. I do see the good reasons. And I know I'm already telling you this isn't going to work, but I just got to let you know, jumping in, this is going to be my job going forward to kind of help hold this process for you too, to join you in the reactivity. I don't need you to put it away, but we do got to kind of have some order into how we kind of do this part together. And so that's going to be my job to help not let this cycle and then blame the cycle session one. I can't let this process beat up on the two of you. And as we talked about on the Frey episode, in turn, both of your good intents and just flip them upside down on their head. That just is horrible and sucks for the both of you. 
that's just kind of my summary so far of where we, where we've been. So with, on this episode, yeah, yeah, I like an old school question. I don't know if this is really perfectly EFT or not, but you know, to uh, De'Aaron's question on hopelessness, and you know, I have had a fair share of session ones where they're just convincing me this is awful and stupid and it'll never work. And mm -hmm. before long, I start to go, you know what? I really don't want to outwork them. So I reflect, 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 validate, validate, validate. So help me understand, why haven't you already given up? Ooh, that's a good one. And so it's their job to defend that. Mm -hmm. I didn't call them, and I did not fix them up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, somehow they match made enough to be together. And you can get a cop-out answer. And I say cop-out, not that it's not important, but it's the cycle speaking when they say, well, it's just for the kids, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. But most of the time, there's an attachment answer behind that door, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's like, well, I do love them. Really? Mm -hmm. You tell me after all this, you just told me for 30 minutes <laughs> and all this pain, mm -hmm. they mean so much to you that you still love them, even right now. Mm. Can you tell them that? I mean, it's, that's way ahead of where we want to be. But sometimes, sometimes that'll happen right there, and that's a nice way to have a little bit of a little bit of hope right there. Because it's one thing to love someone when it's all going your way, but if you still love someone when you're going through hell, that says a lot, mm -hmm. right? So that's the piece I might want to just kind of capture there, if no, it, if it's there. I like it. Well, I think we're about to land the plan on this episode, De'Aaron. Right. We appreciate your question. Uh, of course, we know we didn't extensively maybe yeah. go into some parts, but I like the focus of it. Just in session one, you know, what do you do with these two very hard presenting issues? And so hopefully this was helpful for you. Yeah. Thank you, De'Aaron. Appreciate you. 100%. You all send us some questions. We'll see if we can get you on the air. Thank you for listening. We hope this experience helps you push the leading edge in your work to help people connect with themselves and with each other. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can contact us at pushtheleadingedge at gmail.com. And you can follow us on our Facebook page at Push the Leading Edge. You can follow Ryan on Facebook at Ryan Reyna Professional Training and on his website, ryanreynatraining.com. You can follow James on Facebook and Instagram at DocHawkLPC. You can also check out his website, DocHawkLPC.com.